cephalo hematoma is a good place to start with regards to jaundice. Because if you look at the two situations, you have on this page alone just the caffet. But if you flip it, you have both on the other side. You care about the cephalo hematoma the most because it can lead to jaundice. So cephalo hematoma can lead to jaundice. And remember how we tell the difference. If you think of the cap it on that page that you're on, it has a baseball cap. And if you were to wear a cap, it crosses the suture lines. Whereas a cephala hematoma, which is what you just wrote in, it does not cross the suture lines. It's on one side or the other. And it is concerning. It's not a good thing. It's concerning. So a cephala hematoma is exactly what the word says. Oma means tumor. Cephala means head. Heme means blood. You have a tumor of blood on top of your head, and it's off to the side. So think it through, because we've been kind of talking about this the whole time. Those, those blood cells, a fair share of them are mommies, okay? Because babies always have a lot of maternal blood that is going to die. When maternal blood or even blood in a hematoma actually dies, death of a red blood cell gives you a high bilirubin and subsequent jaundice. So babies with cephalohematomas have a higher rate of jaundice. Babies that have cephalohematomas may have gotten them from forceps, vacuums, scalp electrodes, or some other invasive trauma. So the baby can have a hyperbilirubinemia from a multitude of reasons. It could be that the baby had a cephalohematoma. It could be what we said earlier, which is that ABO incompatibility. It could be because mommy is Rh negative and there is some Rh sensitization. Or as we've already said, trauma to the presenting part ahead. Now, this hyperbilirubinemia, if it's going to be pathologic, then you're going to have an issue with kernicterus. So pathologic hyperbilirubinemia is called kernicterus. And of course, icteric means jaundice. Physiologic is normal, especially with breastfeeding babies. The excretion of bilirubin is done through pooping. So the more you can get the baby to poop, the more you can get the baby to get rid of their bilirubin. Physiologic jaundice is almost unheard of in California because the sun breaks down bilirubin. So they just put the baby by the window. Break it down, it's fine. Physiologic. Pathologic 
very often occurs in the first 24 hours. It's the symbolic of a liver problem. This baby needs Billy Ruben lights or a blanket, Billy blanket or Billy lights. Billy blanket or Billy lights. Pathologic requires Billy Rubin lights or Billy Rubin blanket, right? Billy lights, we call it a Billy blanket. In other words, lights will break down the Billy Rubin. The blanket is a light, pretty much, a blanket of lights wrapped around the baby. When the baby's under Billy lights, remember to cover the eyes. When the baby's under Billy lights, remember to, hey, Larry, how you doing? Remember to cover the eyes. For this baby, if it's really bad and the jaundice occurs in the first 24 hours, like there's a significant liver issue and this baby is really, really sick, like I was when I was born because there was no Rogam, then I myself and this baby would need exchange transfusions. And that's where we take your blood out of your body, the baby, and we take the antibodies out and give them fresh new blood exchange transfusion. Take it out, give you the good stuff. Uh-huh, yeah. If it's really bad and it happens within the first 24 hours and it's really, really bad, like Billy Lights aren't going to do it, then we have to do what we call an exchange transfusion where we take the baby's blood out, get the antibodies out, ABO incompatibility, Rogam in my case, and then give them back new blood, fresh blood without antibodies in it. The number one reason for a high bilirubin is that ABO incompatibility we talked about. While under the Billy lights, we push fluids. push fluids, encourage more and more breastfeeding. We teach mommy, even with the baby that has physiologic, normal jaundice, we teach mom, even with the baby that has physiologic or normal jaundice, to call us if the jaundice gets worse after day three. ABO incompatibility is one in five babies, so it's very common, super duper common. This carnicterus, or extremely high bilirubin, leads to brain damage. Mental retardation. In the newborn period, remember also that we're going to do some screenings. Newborn screening, also called metabolic or PKU testing. This is going to test for up to 30 diseases. It is a state law. So as a nurse tech, the first nurse tech ever hired at Hillcrest, that was my job, to go around doing the little baby's PKU test and vital signs on everybody, right? So uh, PKU or metabolic screening, the baby does have to eat and they have to have eaten and this is always a major issue on test, but they have to have eaten for at least 24 hours some type of protein, so breast milk or formula or whatever the deal is. And then, like we said, it's state law, and they have about 30 different tests that they're testing for. They test for thyroid, congenital thyroid disorder, PKU, sickle cell, cystic fibrosis, galactosemia, all kind of bullshit. So it's a lot of stuff that they're testing for. Now, in your package, you have a little handout that's called Torch. So we have to do our infections. 
porch. mnemonic and it's a very important mnemonic because certainly we have a couple of high risk situations and I give you a couple of um, what do you call it different ways to look at this here yeah? toxo plasmosis and I'm sure this is already written probably is it? Yeah. Other, I always tell you for this one to put a couple things. I tell you to put uh, syphilis, HIV. Is it there? Yeah. Oh, thank God. For R, you got rubella. For C, I tell you to put cyto, megalovirus. And then I use it also for chicken pox. Just to add another C. And then the H I use for two purposes, herpes, hepatitis. Oh, I know what other one I wanted you to add that's not there, shingles. So let me just say at the outset, no pregnant nurse can take care of a patient with shingles or chicken pox. Let's just get that out the way. <laughs> no pregnant nurse can take care of shingles, chicken pox, or cytomegalovirus that she knows of anyway. Everything else is fair game. When it comes to toxoplasmosis, remember the two things, cats and raw meat. Don't forget the raw meat, because most people know cats, but they forget the raw meat. Now with toxoplasmosis, that's why we tell pregnant women they can't empty the kitty litter, because of the toxo. And we also make sure that all food that is ingested by a pregnant mother is well cooked. But more importantly, when you look at torch, you have two problems. You don't just have the pregnant woman, but you have, in this case, a high-risk baby that could be in big trouble as well. I can't see the baby emptying the kitty litter. Can't see that. Can't see this Mickey baby eating raw meat. But these are both issues for mom. So those are issues for mom that you get. You understand. The syphilis is an issue for both. So when you look at syphilis, uh, this is really concerning in a preemie or newborn because they can have a rash and it can be all over everywhere, not just their um, palms or their feet or the, the I mean, the soles of the feet or the palms of their hand, but it can be around their mouth. They can have excoriation around the mouth. They can have rhinitis, which is a runny nose from syphilis, so congenital syphilis. They can have the whole hearing blindness, all this crap, you know. We don't see it as much, but still, that's why all pregnant women are screened. HIV, we covered it already. Remember that you cannot catch shingles from anybody. You can only get chicken pox from somebody with shingles. I'm going to say that again. You cannot catch shingles from anyone. You can only get chicken pox when you're exposed to somebody with shingles. So you can't catch shingles from anybody. Rubella is a troublemaker. This is definitely going to give us some problems. Um, it can be very deadly. Um, but then with this, 
when it comes to the pregnant patient, they are all tested. And if they have a titer less than or equal to one to eight, they're considered rubella non-immune. Now you want to put a little note about the rubella because rubella is in MMR vaccine and pregnant ladies can't get no MMR vaccine. So even if they are rubella non-immune, they can be vaccinated. You know that. Those in my class know that. Okay, so you're just going to be ass out. So we say hand washing. And of course, we say that you give them this vaccine postpartum. Okay. All right. Now, cytomegalovirus is so weird, so annoying, because when it comes to cytomegalovirus, Kids have it routinely. Children always have it. So it's hard to say, oh, don't go around anybody without cytomegalovirus. But yet it is very pervasive. It's a problem. Um, it's kind of scary because of the NICU being a place where babies are. And they just are at such higher risk for infection. And remember why preemies are at higher risk for infection. Number one, they never got the benefit of maternal antibodies because they never got to breastfeed. Number two, they're around nurses, and NICU nurses are much better than everybody else in the hospital, but there are still some assholes who remain uh, with acrylic nails, and chipped nail polish or acrylic nails is killing our babies. So usually you get under so much flack at the hospital that you don't dare wear acrylic nails into the NICU. But these babies have been literally killed with acrylic nails. So the lack of breastfeeding means the mother does not get the antibodies. The, um, the nurses, the hospital environment and the nurses with the nails is a big deal. They should be kept really, really short. No chipping in the nail polish, nothing. Mm -mm. That's a big deal. And then the third reason for this baby is that their skin is so thin that it's open for any infection. It's like so thin, it's permeable, it's easy to get an infection. So the nurse taking care of this baby has to use reverse isolation. So she has to cover up like she's taking care of a burn patient and really strict aseptic technique. You know, breast milk as soon as we can you know, how that is. So we call it liquid gold in the NICU. Breast milk is liquid gold. And we'd be begging mom to pump from the minute of life. So as soon as I deliver my patients, I, well, you know, I make a call to NICU and they're so sweet. They're really good to me. They give me the double breast pumps and the really nice rooms for my patients so that we can encourage as much as possible to get liquid gold into the babies because it will give them that protection. But cytomegalovirus is one of the worst. Um, it causes blindness, deafness, seizures. Thank God if the child is exposed, the baby, the NICU baby, is exposed to one, two, or three, we can give them immune globulin. So we can give them, if it's hepatitis, we can give them hepatitis B immune globulin. If it's chicken pox, we can give them varicella zoster immune globulin. And for shingles, the same thing, varicella zoster immune globulin. So post-exposure, we can do a couple things with these three conditions. So all is not lost if the exposure is hepatitis B. We can give them this immune globulin, this baby, this brand new baby. And like I've said before, I've had patients with these conditions, and certainly I immediately um, am trying to give this baby a shot. Herpes 
is a whole nother ball game. Remember nurses, if a nurse has a cold sore, <coughs> she cannot work around the newborn. She can't work around the maternity patient. She can't work around the preemie babies. It's too much. No, 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 no cold sores allowed. So that would be herpes simplex one. For genital herpes, if it's active at the time of labor, then mom gets a C-section, as you know. Active herpes at the time of labor, then we're going to have a C-section. Remember that preemies are at risk for these infections and any other 10 times more than anybody in the hospital. 10 times more than everybody in that hospital. 